uh, the governing board know that today the state released uh, the numbers of art seals um, that were earned by school districts across the state. And the Dysart Unified School District had the second highest number of art seals of all the school districts in the state. That's right, give yourself a round of applause. <clears throat> We were only, we, and, and we were just behind Tempe Union um, in, that, in that piece. However, um, the Dietzert School District has the most, or has the largest number of students that earn more than one seal. So we're very, very proud of our art students. Congratulations to them, and we look forward to honoring them this evening. If we could ask the, the governing board and Dr. Kellis to please um, come down towards the steps so that we can recognize some students, that would be fantastic. This evening, we would like to take the opportunity to recognize some of our outstanding art students and some of their many accomplishments during the 21-22 school year. We're going to announce the discipline, the art discipline, and display a slide on the screen with the student names that are being recognized because we have many this evening. When your name appears on the slide, we would ask you please to come forward and join the governing board and Dr. Kellis and remain there until all students come forward so that we are able to get a photo. And then we're gonna use this new platform, social media. Um, there's Twitter and Facebook and Insta something and all that good stuff. And we're gonna share it out so everybody can see how great you are as well. So we're gonna start off our recognitions with, and we're gonna begin with our talented visual arts students. Visual art students are being recognized this evening for various competitions. If you see your name on the screen, would you please come forward? We have first the Gallery 37 recognition. Students have to apply to be selected for this program in which students work to create a permanent piece of public art alongside a professional artist. Students earn free college credits for participating along with a cash stipend. Students are also being recognized for participating in this category in various local and state level art competitions including the uh, Congresswoman Debbie Lesko Art Award and the New Horizons Art Show. Congratulations to our dedicated and talented students. Would you please give a round of applause? <laughs> and the good news is we don't have to ask you to crowd in with other students on this one. This is a piece of cake. Congratulations again. We're going to continue with our kindergarten through eighth grade visual arts recognition. And these are all the students that, that uh, placed in show this year, whether it be the cybersecurity art competition, the World Art Day art competition, the surprise bookmark competition, the surprise MLK art competition, the AAEAYAM award, and the ESSA art showcase. If your name is listed, would you please come and join us? Would you please give them a round of applause? And before they go, hold on just a minute, because we don't get this opportunity very often. What is your name? Paisley. What is it? Paisley. Very nice to meet you, Paisley. And Paisley, what did you do in art this year? Um. This is a really important question for you to answer. <laughs> did you draw something? Did you paint something? Very, very good. Well, we just had to come over and say hello. Awesome job, guys. Give me another round of applause. <laughs> Next, we're going to recognize our outstanding musicians. These are students that are being recognized, and they include both vocal 
and instrumental awards. And we're going to start this evening by recognizing our 21-22 students who earned chairs in orchestra, band, and choir. Students go through a rigorous audition process to earn a chair in a regional ensemble against students from the entire West region. Auditions include performing etudes, scales, and sight reading. Selected students get to spend the day working with a clinician and other talented students from, region, from the region with the day culminating with the West Regional Honor Band, Choir, and Orchestra Concert. Congratulations to our musicians. <clears throat> Congratulations again. And next we're going to move to our students who earned a spot in regionals and then got the opportunity to audition for all state. It's the same process as regionals that we outlined, but now they're competing against students from across the state. They have to learn new audition material as well. We're so proud for the first time to have two students that earned placement in the all state honor band and choir are Daniel Alger or Daniel, Danielle Benton with us this evening? Would you please give them a round of applause in absence? <laughs> we also had a wonderful group of students get selected for the Arizona Choral, Choral Educators All-State Jazz and Show Choir. Similar to regionals and state for band and choir, these students take part in a challenging audition that requires them to perform a solo excerpt and then participate in a dance audition. Congratulations to our 21-22 All-State Show Choir students. Would you give them a round of applause as well? That's right, don't be shy, come on down. You were here before, you know, you know the routine. Congratulations. <laughs> the following students were selected to participate in the Arizona Music Educators Association Elementary and Junior High All-State Band. If your name is on the screen, come on down. Students participating in the sixth grade ensemble were nominated by their teacher and then selected by the AMEA coordinator panel. Students in the seventh and eighth grade had to mail in an audition tape and then were selected amongst their peers. Just like high school, these students had the opportunity to travel to the East Valley to spend the day working on a concert made up of their peers across the state and a highly recognized clinician. And we just wanna say thank you so very much for representing the Dysart School District in such an awesome way. Would you give them a round of applause? Great job, guys, way to go. We wanna say congratulations to our students who either earned an excellent or superior rating at the Arizona Music Educators Association Solo and Ensemble Festival. If your name is on the screen, come on down. This festival requires students to come with either a solo or a small ensemble group to perform for a judge who gives them feedback and rates them. Many of these solos are groups Many of these solos and groups are performing college audition level pieces that will then be used for scholarship opportunities their junior and senior year. Students performed in the areas of voice, wind, percussion, and piano. Would you please give these students an outstanding round of applause. Congratulations again. <laughs> Next we move on to the art area of dance. I have to tell you having to, having subbed for one class period of dance this year at Valley Vista High School, I have a newfound respect for the dance teachers. 
and I'll sub anything else again except dance, it's too hard. <laughs> the following students have met the criteria for National Dance Organization's National Honor Society of Dance Arts. In order to earn this honor, students must have an overall grade point average of 3.5 or higher, demonstrate teamwork, motivation, and leadership along with earn 30 points for qualifying activities on the National Induction Point System. Do we have any students in the audience this evening? If your name is there, come on down. And if not, we just wanna say congratulations to these students. <laughs> on to the area of theater. We are proud to recognize our thespians. The following students competed at the Arizona Thespian Regional Festival. Students competed in the areas of acting, monologues, duets, and groups, musical, solo duets, and groups, and the theatrical design. The students listed this evening are all, all competed and were earning either an excellent or superior rating. Some of them worked so hard that they broke their ankle in the process. <laughs> Since this is theater, we have to ask, is your ankle really broken or are you acting? <laughs> oh, you broke your leg. Oh, no, it's definitely a Oh, you're faking. Okay, I got you. All right. All right. Congratulations. And with that, we conclude our arts recognitions. We'd like to continue um, to, that, to thank our extraordinary parents and teachers who continue to build up and support our students' talents. The time and dedication it takes to hone a craft takes an entire village, and we wanna say thank you, moms and dads. Thank you, moms and dads, for making sure to drive your kids back and forth to competitions, to drive your kids back and forth to late practices, to cook dinner at different times of the day um, so that they can do what they do. So thank you all to each one of you and congratulations again to our students. Have a great night. Next, we'll move on to um, C, address the governing board, audience with individuals. Ms. Chaffin? Um, we have one person, um, a Miss Allison Ali Klein. Oh, sorry. It's been a while. <laughs> All right. I will go ahead and read the statement. This is the time for the public to comment. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Pursuant to ARS 38-431.01, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism or scheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. In order to facilitate accomplishing the business of the district in a timely manner, a time limit of three minutes will be imposed for each individual or group addressing the board. When you approach the podium, please state your name for the record. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allie Klein, and I'm here representing Friends of the Surprise Libraries. I've been uh, president of Friends since 2002, pardon me, 2012. Friends began as a nonprofit organization supporting public libraries. We then expanded to support school libraries and then expanded again to support teachers, um, reading specialists, um, sorry, lost my place, ELA, new teachers, and reading coaches and everything literacy related. Um, we now support 37 schools in three school districts in addition to the public libraries in both El Mirage and Surprise. 
Um, we're here. Um, the Friends Group has, has really had an opportunity, and you have some um, media in front of you that I dropped off so you could take a look at all the things that we do. One of the things is the bookmark contest that was mentioned just earlier, so that's one of the things that we provide. Working with Dr. Kellis has um, made my job, being president of Friends of the Surprise Library, easier than it had been before. Um, we've had a chance together to work with teachers and students in almost every school in the Dysart District. And Friends has been able to provide $292,403.82 in approved books and other media to classrooms within Dysart. Additionally, we've been able to allow teachers access to great appropriate books and magazines free in our bookstore um, in the amount of 10,456 items. Um, just so that you know, all of these items that are donated or uh, received for your teachers are all reported appropriately to the finance department. Uh, Francie gets an email from us all the time. Um, I'm actually grateful to be able to be uh, working with Dr. Kellis over these years and um, want to let him know how much Friends of the Surprise Libraries appreciates his leadership and how much we have appreciated having such a great partnership with Dysart. And I hope to look forward to another um, ongoing and long relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? That's it. All right. Next, we move on to Superintendent Governing Board update. Uh, I understand we don't have a student update tonight, so we'll move on to Superintendent update. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and members of cabinet. I would first like to um, extend a, a great acknowledgement to our friends of Luke Air Force Base. Uh, last week was the Purple Up for Kids of Military Families. And this is an opportunity where many of the service member families' children who attend DICERT are recognized for the work that their parents do at the base. And it's not just at Luke Air Force Base, it's for all military, but specifically um, there are some planned activities with, with Luke Air Force Base. Luke Air Force Base is the largest training base in the world, and DICERT is more than happy to welcome any family member who serves our country as well as everybody else, but we just want to send out a huge shout out to our, our service member families and their kids who are part of DICERT. I also want to acknowledge uh, DICERT heroes who were recognized last week at a special ceremony. We appreciate you all who were the DICERT heroes recipients. And shortly thereafter, there's a special the next day, a DICERT Education Foundation ceremony I just want to give another shout out to the Dicer Education Foundation for the great work that they do in supporting our students with scholarships. And also a special shout out to our very own Louisa Brown. Today is National Administrative Professionals Day and she is the board's executive assistant as well as the superintendent. So I'd like to thank you for all the work that you do for Dicer. to Governing Board update. I'll go ahead and start. Congratulations, Louisa. It's amazing. Thank you for all that you do. And at a minimum, just putting up with the five of us is a feat in and of itself. So we appreciate you. Um, I, too, attended the Dysart Heroes Awards ceremony. And it was just wonderful to sit and listen to all of the kind words shared by the peers of all the recipients. That's just um, heartwarming to, to hear. Um, from those that actually work with them one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, we, we can hear stories from time to time in general about how amazing our staff are, but um, to actually hear those detailed accounts of what they do every day to make, to rise them to that hero status was just a pleasure to be a part of that. So um, I was glad to attend that. Um, and then this Sunday, I attended the induction of Valley Vista High School uh, girls basketball coach Rachel Matekas into the Arizona High School Coaches Hall of Fame. Um, it was just an amazing moment for her. Um, if anybody, um, as ever, people know, she's not just a, an amazing basketball coach. She's just a phenomenal person that just has um, an ability to have such a positive impact on the lives of students in more ways than one. So it was a, just a beautiful um, afternoon for her, and I wish her congratulations. Um, and then I understand we're having a lot of end-of-year celebrations and concerts. I'm looking forward to our... Valley Vista High School Choir Concert, which I believe is both tomorrow and Friday, so I'm hoping I can attend um, one of those two performances and encourage everyone else at, 
to attend. We have so many talented students in all of our high schools and elementary and middle schools now, and now the time is, is the end of the year is when we get to enjoy all their talents. So I'm um, looking forward to that. That's all I have. Anyone else? Uh, a couple of things. I uh, also attended the Dice Art Heroes uh, ceremony, and it, quite honestly, and just like Ms. Pritchard said, it is a great time to see our Dice Art Heroes shine. Um, just love being a part of that evening of their recognition. Uh, also attended the superintendent's classified and the certified staff advisory councils. Um, these were the last ones for the year, so thank you to all staff that attends to take the information back to their individual schools. Um, I think Dr. Kellis failed to mention that he was also named the honorary chairman, not chairman, honorary uh, base commander for Luke Air Force Base. So he got to fly in an F-16, and uh, I did warn him, make sure you don't eat breakfast before you go up, and you did not. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So congratulations. That's an extreme honor to be uh, recognized as an honorary commander. Uh, attended the uh, couple of the CIP presentations. Uh, thank you to the schools that presented. Uh, also attended the uh, fourth annual uh, Dice Art Education Foundation Scholarship Awards. Uh, I believe there were 17 recipients, $68,000 of scholarships. Uh, to these uh, great seniors that will be going on and continuing their education after they leave Dice Art. So thank you to Billy Laird and uh, Donya Davis Say for everything that they've done. Uh, also attended the Willow Canyons uh, musical, Crazy For You. The young lady that came up here, she did the entire play in a wheelchair. And she did a phenomenal job. The entire cast did a phenomenal job. Um, so thank you to Mr. Walgreen for bringing that exp um, the imagination and the creativity uh, to all of us. And just like Ms. Pritchard said, uh, there are so many end of the year celebrations and the concerts and the uh, dance recitals and so many. You don't need to have a child that's in uh, Dice Art to enjoy some good singing some good dancing and, and instruments and um, musicals and the kids want to show off what they have been working on all year so please um, find a school get an audience and just cheer them on um, last but not least yes uh, dr kellis alluded that uh, today is administrative professionals actually it's a week you guys all have a week but today is the day so thank you to um, uh, Miss Brown for, yes, putting up with the five of us, actually six, and that's Dr. Kellis. <laughs> um, but she and all the other administrative professionals in the district go above and beyond every day. They're the ones that actually run the district. So um, next week, I believe, is Teacher Appreciation Week. Hug a teacher, thank a teacher, and wish them luck for the rest of the school year. And that's about it. Mine's really short <laughs> after that. Um, I did attend a, a couple of the CIP presentations as well. Um, also the Dice Art Hero Ceremony, which was the congratulations to all the heroes in the district, well-deserved. And then I also went to the Dice Art Education Foundation Award Ceremony, and congratulations to the 17 seniors that received scholarships. That was, it was really wonderful to hear their stories. So, that's it. Anyone else? I'd also like to express my appreciation for Ms. Brown, um, and not only just putting up with the board and Dr. Kellis, but really this whole district, so thank you. I mean, I think you get the brunt of almost everything, so I appreciate you, and mm -hmm. I know that many, many people appreciate you. Um, and speaking of appreciation, uh, I also attended the Dice Art Heroes event, and it's, again, it's just, you know, ditto what everyone else has already said, but. Just, just hearing the individual stories about the recognition from um, from the heroes' peers is just really um, a, be a beautiful night, um, hearing those stories and really appreciate all of uh, what Dice Art employees do. And that's it. Thank you, Louisa. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> All right, next we'll move on to item E, motion to approve consent agenda items. I move the governing board approve consent agenda items as presented. Second. 
It's a motion made by Christine Pritchard, seconded by Joe Grant. Motion carries. Next, we move to item G, information discussion. One, information on interventions to promote student growth and improving ap academics at title schools. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and members of cabinet. Dr. Pulling will introduce this item. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, cabinet, and community. It's my pleasure to introduce Kathy Hill, Director of Federal Projects, and Amy Hartshin, Director of Research, and they will present on this item. Good evening, Madam President, members of the Governing Board, Superintendent Kellis, and Cabinet. Thank you for the opportunity to share some information about our Title I schools and the intervention programs that we have there. So if you take a look at this slide, there's some important information that I want to just draw your attention to. So students that come from our higher socioeconomic status homes they have life experiences that students from lower SES homes don't have. An example would be visiting a museum or perhaps going to the zoo. Their parents or, and families have the opportunity to take them places that sometimes children who don't have those opportunities, I mean, they just, they don't have those opportunities afforded to them. So because of that, there are children who have a lower SES, they don't have a certain, they don't have the schema to make those, some of the connections when they get to school. Now please know that these are not excuses. We want to just explain some of the, the, the realities of what we see in our, in our title schools. And then on the last bullet, what I want to make note is that it's not the it's not the number of words that they know, it's the number of words that they hear. So if you'll allow me just a moment to illustrate with a brief example. So a child who is, uh, imagine a family member is cooking dinner and you have two different, two different homes. One, there is a student, um, that comes from a lower socioeconomic background. And so they've asked for a cookie before dinner, and this is the answer they receive, no. Now, another home where it is uh, more of a, a professional home or a middle, what we would call middle class home, what you may hear is this, same question. May I have a cookie before dinner? you know that you cannot have a cookie before dinner and I'm gonna tell you why. You're gonna spoil your appetite and I want you to eat all of these, the vegetables that I'm making for you, all of this great food that is gonna make you strong. After you eat all of your dinner or whatever, you know, after you eat your dinner, then you may have a cookie. So you can see the number of words that the student in the first home heard as compared to the student in the second home, just as a brief example. And something else to consider is that oral language development is inextricably linked to literacy development. If you don't hear the words, you can't say the words. If you can't say the words, you can't read the words. So that is just an important point to, um, to remember. What we wanna share briefly is that how we choose our intervention programs is based on our school improvement process. So our schools work through a comprehensive needs assessment which asks certain questions and asks what are the needs of your school? And the, the schools then determine what are the most important needs that they need to work on. They conduct a root cause analysis then they write out their integrated action plan. So then what I have to do for our, 
for our district plan is then look at all of those trends and patterns and determine what the greatest needs are. So then we see that there may be a need for some, um, and, and I'm speaking from, from our background, when, when we have um, our students who are in high school and they're English learners and they come to us, I cannot put a program that's intended for younger children in front of them. So we have to look what are going to be those programs that are going to be appropriate to teach students the skills that they need. So we do that very collaboratively and we write that into our district action plan. So it's all done in a, in a very collaborative way. Then what we do is when we have these intervention programs, we are sure to provide professional development so everyone understands how to implement that program with fidelity, but also understand is this program gonna meet the needs of the student who's in front of me? Because intervention programs are not, it's not a one size fits all. I could be a, a sixth grader who doesn't have any phonics or phonemic awareness and I'm gonna need something different than the sixth grader who's struggling with comprehension. So just some of those important points to think about as we provide that professional development on how best to use and choose those resources. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Hartgen and she's gonna to talk to you about some data. I'm gonna move this up just a little bit. Good evening. Um, so the first piece we wanted to show you is from our kinder data from the very beginning of this year. And this kind of demonstrates the point that Kathy was talking about, about the difference of life experiences and prior, no, prior knowledge that students enter our schools with. So on the left, you can see um, from our Dibbles data, the left-hand side is our Title I schools and the right-hand side is our non-Title um, schools. The number listed is the average number of letters, uppercase, uppercase and lowercase letters that the students were able to identify at the start of the year. So Dibbles is one of the first tests that our kinder, kindergartners take. And you can see the difference in the average numbers that our Title I students come in knowing and our non-Title I students know. Um, you saw some of a piece of this data last week, um, two weeks ago when I did our data. Um, we showed the beginning of the year and middle of the year. This is one of those tests that is part of the kindergarten, kindergarten composite score. But it's the really simple um, identification of whether or not they know their letters when they arrive. The other piece, um, this looks very similar to you for you from our last data presentation. This one is exactly the same. I've highlighted our two um, title schools that are K-4 and our two title schools that are middle school. Um, you can see here, once again, um, as a reminder, that those growth points were that scale score growth and the expectation of the amount of um, points the students would earn from benchmark one to benchmark three. Um, you can see in um, the K-4s in reading, all four K-4s, title and non-title, um, met their growth expectation. And you can see that um, all of them had an increase from benchmark one to benchmark three. When we look at our middle schools, um, that expected growth was 21. So two, um, our two title schools met expected growth. Our two non-title schools did not meet expected growth. So although their overall proficiency scores are a little bit lower, they did meet those learning expectations. They had that amount of expected growth from benchmark one to benchmark three. This is our Title K-8s and our um, non-Title K-8s. So the top half of the page shows you our um, Title I K-8 schools and their reading benchmark scores. And our um, bottom shows you the non-Title I K-8s and their reading benchmark scores. Um, the expected growth for them was 26. So when you look at um, our growth, um, those pieces, we have um, four of the six title schools met growth and three of the, non, um, three of the six non-title schools met growth. The title one um, proficiency range for benchmark three was between 19 and 41, and there's an overlap with our non-title schools of 37 to 58. Um, so you can see that there is, there is a discrepancy in those, but um, we did have more title one schools make that um, growth expectation. When we look at math, um, we're back to our K-4 and um, middle school models. The K-4 expected growth was 67 and our middle school expected growth was 45. Um, all four of our K-4s met growth and all four of our K-4s were higher than, benchmark, benchmark three was higher than benchmark one. Um, 
When we look at our middle schools, you can see that um, none of our middle schools met that expected growth. Um, a couple of them were um, close or two thirds of the way there. Um, and they had a range of um, between 24 to um, 43%. So their range was a little bit lower than the, the re di reading differentials. When we look at our title and non-title schools, um, you can see that we had um, 52 points of expected growth when we look up at the top, the first couple of title schools. Um, two of the six title schools met expected growth, and five of the six non-title schools met expected growth in math. Um, their range of scores goes from um, 27, or I'm sorry, 20 to 35 for title, and um, 42 to um, 67 percent for non-title. And I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy, who's going to talk about programs that support the data. So we're not going to t spend a lot of time on the, the tiers, because, but we thought that it was important to be sure that everyone has a common understanding of the tiers because we all have, um, we just want to be sure that we lay that groundwork, just like we would do in the classroom. So for, in the multi-tier system of support, you have tier one, which is, in a nutshell, that is your, your classroom instruction. You are working on grade level standards with all of your students. When you're looking at tier two, it is that small group instruction designed for students who are not understanding perhaps the concept that you just taught, so it can be a quick reteach. Or when we're doing walk to read or march to math, when we're doing that tier two, we may be um, having different teachers teach different skills in order to be sure that we're filling those gaps. And then tier three is that more intensive intervention. It's for students who are two to three grade levels behind, and so they're really looking at filling in those, those gaps. And once again, because they're two to three grade levels behind, they are working to build those foundational skills to get the students up to grade level standards. And then with the response to intervention, that's where we're really looking at um, have had these tiers worked if they haven't what are we doing to support them so that's all a part of the multi-tier system of support once again just want to lay that that framework for what those tiers are so we have a common vocabulary and as I mentioned before when we look at the trends and patterns in our integrated action plan we sometimes determine that there is a need for human resources because although we can have intervention programs, the programs aren't the most important component in the classroom. It's always going to be the teacher. The teacher is the most important individual in the education of a student. We do have these supports. So for the tier three reading, and math interventionists, they are providing that instruction. As I shared, they're typically two to three grade levels behind. At some of our title schools who determined that they needed to have this type of a position, we have a family outreach specialist. And so their main focus is helping the families navigate the educational system. So it's more of that academic piece. Um, how do I get into Schoology? How can, you know, how can I check a child, my child's grades? Um, for high school, how do I help them fill out their um, FAFSA application? And so that's, those are just a few of the things that our family outreach specialists do. Um, we also have some of our schools that have instructional assistance, and so they provide that support in that tier two and that tier three intervention. And then we have school data improvement specialists at our K-8 title schools, and what they do is their main purpose is to provide that data to leadership and to teachers, so actionable items, so they can take action steps that will create better 
opportunities for students to meet grade level standards. So how do I take the data that I have, determine what it is that my children need, and then create action steps from there. And then these are our title, these are the specific intervention programs that, once again, going back to that school improvement process, it's always about making those better um, and the very best decisions that we can for our children. We have achieved 3,000 reading, and Dysart High School is, they're different because they have achieved 3,000 reading and they're using it in a supplementary manner in ELA, social studies, and science. It is a great way to give students the reading passages at their own Lexile level, and it aligns to grade level standards, and teachers can choose what passages to assign to students. For tier two, we have actively learn, and that is for literacy, and achieve 3,000 math, and then for tier three, you can see that for our K-8s, we have achieved 3,000 literacy and we have achieved 3,000 math. The beauty of having these programs is that we also have an implementation manager who is, provides professional development, ongoing professional development, which as all of you know, is very, very important to continue. It's not just one time that I'm getting information on this system. On, and how to utilize this resource, it's going to be that continuous um, professional development. We also, <clears throat> excuse me, evaluate the effectiveness and, you know, is, is the program along with, you know, um, with the implementation, is it really doing what we say that we want it to do? And that starts at the campus level with the site administrators. What the beauty of having that implementation manager is that the administrators can schedule the time when it works for them with their schedules, and they can determine, do I want someone to model? Do I want them to talk about the data from the system during Prep Connects? They have, they have the ability to um, schedule that themselves, but then we also have that district support. So we attend those <coughs> meetings um, and listen to what it is that the program is doing or not doing, what do we need to do, how can we assist. So we attend those meetings as well when, when we're able to. And then once again, you know, for our new teachers, training begins before school. We try to have that, um, that training when we have our three days back and then throughout the school year, and once again, it can be on Mondays, it can be during Prep Connects, it can be whenever the site administration determines that it's going to be best for their teachers and their school site. And then here are just some of the specific programs that are supported with title funding. We have AVID at the following schools. Um, Leader and Me is at, our, is at Riverview. We have positive behavior intervention supports at, our, at the schools that are listed. Five of our schools are 21st century schools, and that is a before and after school program. We also have kinder experience, and that's for our students who are in Title I schools, and it gets students accustomed to school. When we, have, when we um, ask teachers to reflect on how the kinder experience went with their children who've not ever, for some of them, who've not ever been in school. They have said that it was really great and then they could see how impactful it was that first um, day, that first week of school. I'm not sure how many of you have ever been in kindergarten classrooms on the first day of school. You have lots of runners and you have lots of criers. So um, I remember um, starting when I started at El Mirage, they're like, we're gonna have you at kindergarten today. I'm like, well, I, we need you at kindergarten today. No problem. Because I was an instructional coach at the time, and so I knew that I needed to support in those classrooms. But this kinder experience gets them accustomed to school, and that's just a way that we provide that transition from preschool to school age, so. And then here are some of the district supports that we have. Um, 
myself, we have our um, directors of curriculum and instruction. We have Ms. Hartgen, our literacy coordinator, Adriel Greasehaber, and our content specialist. We participate in their leadership meetings. We have different data meetings with them, and whether that's on Monday PD or during Prep Connects. We also work with them on lesson planning. We conduct classroom walkthroughs and we provide that feedback. Sometimes having that outside of your school set of eyes will give you a different, can help give a different perspective. And then we also have a master schedule review. Um, I'm not sure what the background of everybody is in maybe try, if you've ever had to build a schedule before, but if you don't have all the pieces aligned just right, then it doesn't, it doesn't work and you can't get the supports in that you, that you need. So that is something that we definitely have been looking at very closely and helping our schools understand how to schedule. And then there was also a larger um, um, professional development provided by um, a vendor, like an outside consultant to help our schools as well. We're very excited this year, we have an EL itinerant teacher and she is able to go to two campuses that have our highest English learner populations. And so what she does is she provides that targeted um, English development and whenever I see her, her children are talking, she's working with the teachers, she's supporting the things that are happening in the mainstream classroom, but she, and then from her perspective, she's working on that English language development. If you remember, like I said, if they can't hear the word, then they can't say it. If they can't say it, they can't read it. So that's why that oral language development, especially with our English learners, is very important as well. And then we have our, uh, one of our federal project specialists. She provides walkthroughs and she goes to our intervention classes. She walks with our school data improvement specialists and she provides feedback on what they're doing, how they're implementing the program, et cetera. So, and we have been planning next steps. As I spoke about before, in the very beginning, um, we may have different populations of students who need different resources. So we're constantly looking for resources that will meet students' needs. Um, as I alluded to before, we need some of those things to be age agnostic. You would not, we have a program that's called Smarty Ants. It's a part of the Achieve um, 3000 interventions for our K-3 students. And, but it, it's very, it's very K-3. It is, you, you would not want to put that in front of a high school student, even though they're the same skills. So we're constantly looking for things that are age appropriate, but also meet their needs. So some of those things that we're implementing um, next year and working with our ESS department on are tier three reading interventions, reading mastery, corrective reading, and read to achieve. I personally, when I was a classroom teacher, utilized corrective reading. It made a, a huge impact on the skills that my students needed. And this, when we have this, this entire range of programs that are gonna meet the, our students' needs, we're very excited about being able to share this new um, tier three intervention program with our um, interventionists. We're also looking at high, um, low cost resources, not high cost resources, low cost resources, Hegarty. And once again, it's designed to address the phonological awareness skills, but for those students who are in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, which typically if you're in school in you know K-3 and you've been able to be a part of our educational system, you would have had by the third grade. However, we do know, especially with our English learner populations, that some children, they come to us later on in their educational career and we need to address those, those, um, those needs. And then once again, I've already shared with you about the master scheduling. So we're looking at that and the intervention schedule and also looking at that data to ensure that correct grade levels and students are being scheduled because we wanna be sure 
that the students who need the intervention are the ones who are receiving it and are receiving it correctly. So with that, the, does anybody have any questions? I'm sure you do, Ms. Pritchard. I saw you writing furiously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I appreciate the time you took to put this together, though. Um, and I do, have, I do have some questions and thoughts, and I know that this was kind of like an introductory item, and we'll talk more during our study session that we have next month about it, but um, if, if this will also help staff prepare for that, um, first of all, just to clarify, on your first slide, how are, you, how are you defining professional household? And so that is, that is a good question. This, so we have done Ruby Payne research and professional development, excuse me. We haven't done the research she did. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're utilizing what their definition is. Traditionally, a professional household is, um, a parent who has a college education. I can get a more specific definition for you. No, I assumed that. that yeah. I, I was assuming that's probably what it meant, but I didn't want to assume. I, yes. I didn't know if there was anything more to that. Um, so in your research then, or the research that you were pulling from, mm -hmm. they're attributing that to a, a reason as to why children are may struggle academically. And that, that piece of it for me, um, I struggle with only because, and I'm saying these, I'm saying these comments to, in general, even, so please don't take them as a criticism to your presentation at all or anything. They're just general, whoever can help, again, for that next study session to help fill in some of these blanks, I'd appreciate it. But that, um, unless I'm not understanding correctly, that bothers me a little because I feel like, or I can stipulate to the fact that children that come from maybe lower socioeconomic homes don't necessarily have the same experiences, like you had talked about museums, things like that, that might have a high cost associated with them. But I don't, I always get a little bit uncomfortable or frustrated when um, there's ever, um, whenever anyone were to hint that maybe that's an, and you said it's not an excuse, but I'm going to use that word because it's for the lack of time and ease. I'm going to say I don't want excuses to be made as to why then those students can't learn or, or grow academically mm -hmm. because I don't feel like that has anything to do with their capacity to learn, especially now if those parents were homeschooling, perhaps I could see if those parents maybe didn't have the education um, to then teach their children, maybe I could get that. But if, if these children are in our schools and they're surrounded by highly educated, highly skilled staff and teachers that we have, then I feel like that's an excuse I don't want to lean on, you know? And you're, the word, if I could, is that what you had said is true. There, there's not, um, they do have the capacity to learn. So, as an ex when I worked at the Department of Education, I worked in the Office of the English Language Acquisition. It was EAS at the time, but my supervisor was bilingual, and she says they're language deficient. It's not that they can't learn. So your point is well taken. It is, we just wanted to present that it is that language development, and so sometimes teachers at title schools, they have to let their children talk more but give them that rich academic vocabulary so they will start to use the, that terminology. So once again, yes, not an excuse, and I and, and definitely understand they absolutely have the capacity to learn, and that's one of the things in our integrated action plan and on our comprehensive needs assessment is that there are high expectations for all learners. And I think, so. sorry, just no, as no. an example of that, um, you've heard me present for Dysart High School before in the past, and you, we've watched. It's time, and it's time, and, and these interventions in these programs, our students would come in with low Algebra 3, 4 scores, but by the time we get to our, or I'm sorry, low, low Algebra 1, 2 scores, but for several years in a row, by the time they got to Algebra 3, 4, we were at and above district average. So it, it is that time and those really intentional interventions that do make up that opportunity, but there is... There are gaps that we have to fill out and, and we have to make sure that we're giving them those opportunities to recover that learning. And so um, it was really just to kind of give that example of um, 
a, a common reality of what, what happens in the differences of, you know, you, if you asked what, what was your summer like for the two kids, like a, a student at Canyon Ridge and a student at El Mirage, that's going to be a very different or could be a very different um, summer experience of life, life experiences that went along with that. And that, that creates that schema because if I ask you um, to tell me about Disney World and you've been and experienced it, you have a whole schema in your head. You can pull for me tons of things you've done. If I ask a student who's never seen it and the only reference they have is Mickey Mouse, they have nothing to tell me. And that's where all of this language and everything builds off of is their life experiences. So I'm from Chicago. I, I lived in snow. If you grew up here and you've never been up to Flagstaff and I ask you to tell me about snow, you don't know it. You can't tell me anything about it except for what you've heard versus me who lived in Chicago and has the wind and the snow and the blizzards and the drifts. I have different life experiences that build my schema and my understanding of language and, and all of those types of things. So when our kids get a reading passage on a state test and it talks about a blizzard and they grew up in the desert, that's all of our kids. Like, how many of our kids have been up in, in Flagstaff in a blizzard? If they have to read about it and they don't have a life reference, that's just a disadvantage for them in that thing because they don't have the context for learning related to it. Right, I get that, but like even as you just said, it did, that wouldn't necessarily have to do with socioeconomic status. That could be someone who's just never lived in slow snow. So right. I would just prefer that as a district, we don't, we don't reference the fact or try to correlate that someone's lack of income has anything to do with their capacity to learn or why maybe they are not doing as well academically because although, like I said, if it's if it were up to the, the parents to have to teach their children, that would be one thing, but, but I know, and I was just thinking about your presentation last time, we look at Dysart High School. Okay, there, that's a title, mm -hmm. right? Yep, look how, highly titled. Look how mm -hmm. much they have grown. Mm -hmm. Same kids, same area, and when I said, what's the difference? Well, they really dive into their data every week. You know, so again, capacity to learn, they can, mm -hmm. has nothing to do with, I mean, my parents, I mean, as far as perfect um, example of professional home, neither one of my parents graduated college, and I'm a master's prepared professional with an above average IQ. Has nothing to do with my parents being a professional in a professional household. So kids can do, I don't want us to give up on children based on their socioeconomic status. I get what you're saying, that they may not have that trip to, to Disney World, or they may not know what snow is, but when they're in our schools, I want I don't want people to look at them as already at a disadvantage and not as able to learn just because of the house they go home to at mm -hmm. night. Yeah, absolutely. So that that's that's one piece of it for me. Um, Madam President, the, yes. I'm sorry if I could just comment on that. Um, and I think what um, you've heard is a very strong statement that nobody's questioning their capacity to learn. But the, the place that they come to us, whether whatever life experience that they've had, nobody's saying that they can't learn or that, um, that they won't learn or that they're at an incapacitated place in their learning position. It's just that they are in a different position and it's at, they are at the disadvantage. We know that all students can learn. There's no excuses. All students can learn. The variable could be time. The variable um, could be the resources to get everybody on the same plane. So where everybody has the same finish line, which is graduation, I think we kind of could even look beyond that and say success in life. But the, the finish line is the same, but the starting point is different. And it doesn't mean that they can't finish the line. We want, and we know everybody can cross that finish line. But we know that some will need additional supports and resources to cross that line. Well, and I think that's, that's what it's about, is whatever differences exist, it's meeting each student where they are. So I get that, and it should never be a one-size-fits-all approach to education. I get that kids learn differently, and there's going to be a light bulb going off for one kid that didn't work for the other, and it's our job to find out what that is and meet them where they are so they can get to that finish line. And it can look different. It doesn't have to be the same. It's just getting them there. And again, Dysart High School has tapped into the secret. They, and they, they've proven that these kids can still excel and achieve and make the growth. And I always cringe when I see, and I know of parents, that just because they have an El Mirage zip code, 
they're already feeling like, well, I'm at a disadvantage. I have to take my child to a surprise school, which even like for high schools, for example, just thinking of one example, Shadow Ridge, amazing place to be. Who, you know, who, who wouldn't love to go to Shadow Ridge? But you know what, then, then they're happy. But then what about the kids who don't have parents that can drive them across town to Shadow Ridge or one of the other high schools? And they ha they, they're at the school that they're at, and they rely on us to be able to get them to that finish line in the way that works for them. So, so that's where, and like you're showing the growth, and I appreciate that you put it in that same format as you did when you did the presentation because it's easy to understand and compare what you're saying with what the growth is. But when we look at proficiency, why, why, are, why is there such a discrepancy with, def, with uh, proficiency? Like even with some Freedom Traditional at 62.75 proficient, but then you look at Thompson at 14.35. I mean, the proficiency rate is just so vastly different for a lot of these that um, that's where I'd like to see. I want to see, and you, you mentioned, you talked about actively learn and achieve 3,000. Mm -hmm. Do we have evidence to show that these programs are effective. Because if we, it's been, and I, I'll only say a decade because that's all I can really speak to as far as being this involved in a school district, but our title schools have historically struggled. Mm -hmm. So is any, we can say we have all these programs in here, but have we taken the time to look to say, are these evidence-based programs that are showing results? Yes, and we do have that data. And so there, as we talked about variables with children, there are variables in if that program is going to work. So sometimes you get general type data. Um, what we need, what we do with interventions is because students sometimes are two to three grade levels behind is how are they growing in interventions? Has their lexile increased? And so we do look at that lexile growth. And so that helps us know that that program is effective for that student. So, so lexile, like the Read 180 program? So that, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with how Read 180 tests, but the lexile is you need to, in order to read like a manual, you need to read at a 1600 lexile or something like that. So it's different lexile levels for different grade levels. So, and some of our students have made tremendous mm -hmm. growth in, in Achieve 3000 because they get to work at their lexile level and then that helps them to increase their lexile level because, you know, with Vygotsky, they're not at their zone, you know, they're at their zone of proximal development. They're not at their frustration level where they are not able to, to read and comprehend. But Achieve 3000 focuses a lot on the, the reading comprehension aspect. And for like my example with say, because when I taught fifth grade, I had a little girl, she didn't know her letter names and sounds. She, that program would not have been what she needed. She needed something else. I had, because she wasn't making any progress on her Dibbles, progress monitoring, she needed a different program. And so she would have been put in like a reading mastery program, which is where it's focusing on those letter names and sounds, that phonics, that phonemic awareness. So she wouldn't have shown, she may not have shown some lexile growth because she wasn't using the Chief 3000, she was using a different program, but she was getting what she needed so then she could engage in those comprehension activities that were on Achieve 3000. Mm -hmm. Well, when we look at whether or not these programs are effective, do you look at them specific to our students or just Yes. In general, because then at what point, how often do you look to see whether or not these, these particular programs could be great for maybe kids on the East mm -hmm. Coast or the southern part of our country, whatever, but do they work for us? Yes. And how often, do we, how often do we keep a program and monitor before we're like, you know what, this isn't doing it. We need to look at a different program for this population at Absolutely. the school. Absolutely. Great question. With, with the implementation manager and Achieve 3000, which is now, they bought been brought, bought out by McGraw-Hill, we have a great team that supports our schools 
I meet with them once a month. We discuss how students are progressing in the program. Are they making Lexile gains? They take the, it's called the level set. They take it twice per year, so that shows really how they've grown from the beginning to the end of the year. But it's looking at, are they being able to engage with the program? Have there been like smaller changes within, are they scoring 75% or higher on each of the um, passages that they're asked to read? So we, we work with that implementation manager. Um, what's going to be really great this year is because it's McGraw-Hill and the programs that I were on the last slide with the Reading Mastery, Corrective Reading, and Read to Achieve, because those are McGraw-Hill and Achieve 3000 was acquired by them, she will be able to support all of those programs in all of our schools. And so there will be um, an even greater um, Support. Yes, support and presence where that professional development will be even more ongoing because she will be here in a larger capacity than she was this year because of the service that we pay for. Mm -hmm. So when we look at, as I explained before, with the school improvement process and to your what you had asked, are we reviewing? Absolutely. What is it that we need? We need that continuous <coughs> professional development. We know that there are some other things that we need for our tier three students that, that um, some of our programs are not, are perhaps are not meeting. So we're, we're constantly making sure that our interventionists have that professional development so they understand. My student isn't doing this well, this is the program that they need because if you try to put them in this other one, it's not gonna meet the need that they have. So what would you say, the two of you, what would you say is your best guess as to, to explain the, the lower proficiency when it comes to our title schools? Like why, why are we where we are in regard to that and our lack of progress in, again, raising that proficiency level? What do you think the answer is? What's the reason? The reason or the ant like there's, why, for me that's why? two things like there's okay yeah, yeah. The, the answer would be like the solution but yeah. no the the reason like why are we still struggling with proficiency in our title schools? I think there's a couple things and I you know it's hard I, I don't want to say pandemic but we no. haven't had a couple good years of consistent testing so I think we will have better understanding because for example we've only implemented achieve a couple years and we've only tested once since we've started implementing it school-wide. So we don't even have good longitudinal data to say this program's really working. I have the data to show that my kids, when I was at Dysart, made several years growth of um, Lexow levels in their reading. But I don't have multiple years of data to say these are the kids who never used it and these are the kids who did in state testing. But aside so, from that, though, like pandemic, that's two years. But our title right. schools have been struggling right. for more than two yes. years. So that's what I'm saying in general. What would you say is is the reason I think it's still we're, we have gaps to still recover I think we are getting much better about like Kathy said really knowing that master schedule and making sure that they're not missing oh sorry not missing tier one instruction time to get tier two or tier three supports um, so that I'm not missing at grade level standards to go be pulled for you know, my, the ones that they're trying to recover that are my fifth and sixth grade standards. So really being intentional, I think schools are doing a much better job about that. Um, I, I think for this year, part of it has been attendance. Kids are still not engaging in school on a daily basis like we would love them to. And I don't think that's a title issue. I think that's an across the board issue. I think we have attendance issues. Um, I think in terms of other um, proficiency type things is just really making sure we're motivating kids. Um, to, to take the test um, seriously. And we see that um, particularly as the, the gr higher the grade, the harder it is to get the kids, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Lower kids do things because they love their teacher and they want to make their teacher proud. Our, our upper grades, sometimes that's a struggle. And it's really, that goes back to making those relationships and connecting with kids. Teachers who have really strong relationships with their students, the students want to make that teacher proud and they want to perform. And we need to make sure that teachers are using that to, 
to get kids to say, hey, I need you to show us what you learned. You need to be really proud of what we've done this year and getting them to realize that although it is a test, that really helps us say, look how much you've learned this year and be proud of what you've done. And so I think that's really um, an opportunity for us to continue to get kids to show us what they know because I, I don't necessarily agree that these reflect what all of our Title I students know. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and I, I think that that is an underestimate of how they're actually performing because our unit test um, that we give on a regular basis show us otherwise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm not on. On slide number nine, uh, it had to do the overview of the multi-tiered yep. system. Um, with, so we have tier one, we have tier two, and we have tier three. Do we have anything that shows, um, oh, like a particular school is doing exceptionally well there? Eighty percent of the school is like tier one, um, or we have. Um, one school is more tier two than anything. I mean, do we have anything that shows? Then, I, you, I know it's a weird question. Do you mean like that shows the number of students who are in tier two instruction and the number of students yeah. who are in tier three instruction? Guess, yeah. Well, so the way that, that we work with the tiers is that all of our students are in tier one. Mm -hmm. There may be some students who need some small group instruction, but all of our students, when it's, because it's built into the master schedule, they all go to tier two. So if we're all fifth graders, we're all going to different teachers. We're all getting tier two, we're getting what we need though. So you may need a different skill than I do. So I don't think that we have exactly what you're looking for. Okay, I, I, I know it was a weird question. I was listening to um, some of the things that you were actually saying about that and then mm -hmm. something just sparked off into my head and I don't know why. Um, we have these many programs and yes, historically there have been uh, not only dice art schools but uh, Title I schools in general. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it is what it is. Um, there isn't a silver bullet in order to make these, you know, the scores go up or anything. Um, what do you think that this EL itinerant teacher is going to really bring? Um, I mean, what what resources were we providing before this teacher came on? So that is a great question. So the state model is that we have, for our English learners, we have targeted and explicit instruction, which is 60 minutes just with ELs, all day long, or I mean for one hour, not all day long, sorry, for one hour. Integrated is then done for the remainder of the day. You do have to provide integrated instruction at least 60 minutes okay. in the day. So the beauty of teaching, so I'm gonna go back to what I know, fifth grade teacher. So when I would have my students and say we were doing a unit on weather. So I could, I would teach my grade level standards, my Arizona academic standards, and then I would have my ELP standards, English language proficiency standards, excuse me, English language proficiency standards as my support for my English learners. And then what I would do is then I would pull a small group of my English learners to provide them some explicit English language development where now my English language proficiency standard is what's driving my instruction, but I'm still using that same content standard. So I basically just flip-flopped. So if they don't, and so they flip-flop the standard. So it's mm -hmm. the same two standards, but one is the main driver in the integrated where it's all the children together and then when it's just the English learners, it's the English language proficiency standard that's driving my instruction. So I'm focused more on that English language development piece during that time. Okay. So the, the teacher will provide that. They, in the, the gen ed classroom, will, will provide that if they don't have our EL itinerant teacher. And once again, she's just one person, so she gets to be at two schools. 
What she gets to do, however, is she gets to talk to the fifth grade teacher. Oh, you're doing a unit on weather. You want them to be able to write a paragraph. Um, so then when they come to me, I need to support them. I need to um, scaffold for them because I'm seeing, yeah, they can't write paragraphs, which is what my teachers have said, because they don't know how to write a complete sentence yet. So I'm going to provide that, that English language development to get them where they can te um, write a paragraph. So she's just pulling out and doing the targeted piece. So when she's not there, the teachers are expected to do both the targeted and the integrated instruction. And so we're doing a lot of professional development with our language acquisition mentors. We have a, um, we're actually doing some strategic planning tomorrow with WestEd. They have um, EL and ESS. Dr. Uh, Montano and I are working together on how we can ensure that, and that while these strategies are good for all, they're imperative for our English learners and our students with disabilities. So, um, so we are working to ensure that everyone has those high expectations for all of our children. So, okay. yeah. All right, thank you. Welcome. I have a question. Um, I just kind of wanted to clarify. Um, you said that when students are coming to school from these, um, you know, from the professional and non-professional households, you said the main difference is language deficiency. Is that correct? I, I don't use the term deficiency, but they have their gaps in their learning. So they, may, they have less words that they've heard when throughout their experience. And that's why with First Things First, birth to five, they talk about the, the parents being their child's best teacher. And we want to talk to them about how do you talk to your children. And so you kind of narrate those things and give them more of that language so they do have those experiences and they do hear those words. So I look at things from what children bring, look at their um, strengths. So they, there are gaps, but I wouldn't say they're deficient. They're not deficient. And to, and to determine the data for this language gap, uh, we're using Dibbles in kindergarten or in every single grade? Dibbles well, is K in the elementary. Right, but it doesn't determine like a language gap. So it is a diagnostic assessment that looks at reading. So when there's a very different process for identifying children who are English learners when families enroll their children, if they answer um, other than English on to any three questions, then they're then they're identified, and we by law we are required to assess them with the Azela placement test, which would determine if they're an English learner or not that sometimes could determine like a true language gap, like if they don't have English as a first language. But there, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily, the Dibbles would identify like a language gap. They're looking at that phonics piece. So how do we determine which students have that language gap and so therefore might need a little bit more because I kind of, I, I understand the, the verbiage that you used and I kind of shared Ms. Pritchard's concern about just categorizing people based off of their socioeconomic status or based off of their parents because we've got parents who've got college degrees who don't talk to their children. They sit them in front of a TV because they're working all the time. We've also got parents in low income households who maybe they're low income because one parent works and one parent has chosen to stay home. And so that low income parent may say more to their children in one day than that college educated parent. So, you know, I guess I just wanna, I wanna know how, is there a way where we identify which students have that language gap? So I think first I'm gonna address your, the 
the research that we shared is large-scale research. We are certainly not saying that students who come from low-income families don't have any of these experiences or that students who come from high-income families have all of these. It is just research that shows that over large amounts of things, the amount of words that are heard between those is just an example of the difference in the experiences students come to school with, which is why there are programs in place like Title I that prevent or provide all of these additional resources to ensure that over the course of time, students are able to fill those gaps and have the exact um, same level of understanding and mastery of standards as students um, in non-title schools, the whole purpose of, of, of that Title I piece. The Dibbles is used district-wide as our reading assessment or read, um, phonemic awareness and, and readiness assessment. It's not just used at Title I schools, it's done district-wide. And then all of those assessments, the letter recognition is just one piece of it. All of those then drive all of the 95% core phonics instruction that our teachers use in their core instruction and in their tier two instruction. So that Dibbles screener that's done beginning of the year, middle of the year, and the end of the year, and then they progress monitor with that is how they determine who needs those assistance. And then they regularly use the 95% um, assessments to say maybe I'm working on blends and I'm, I'm not, as you guys know, I'm not a K3 person, but maybe I'm working on blends and I still haven't mastered blends. So I'm, I'm in tier two for blending my letters where this student over here is working on their consonant, vowel, consonant, um, patterns, sorry. So it is all very geared towards what skills the students have in that phonemic awareness, um, phonological awareness, and making sure that they're all moving through those um, skills and are ready to read by the time they are um, moving through. Did that answer your question? Um, sort of. Maybe we can just take a, a little bit deeper dive next week in our study session. Good. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share, um, I too struggled a little bit with the verbiage, um, the verbiage choice in the presentation, um, just around the parents and the working professional piece, um, but I appreciate your, your explanation of that, and I think I'm understanding the intent a little bit more now. Um, Ms. Chaffin mentioned language gap, but I think you're really, I mean, what's in writing anyway, you're really talking about a vocabulary gap. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and in the example that you provided about the parent saying no to the cookie, um, I mean, I guess I would argue how many times did that child ask for a cookie? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's an everyday thing. I, that is right. true. Yes. <laughs> you know, we get tired of explaining ourselves sometimes. <laughs> so it's just sometimes it is a simple no. Yep. Um, but also, you know, under the I had some notes here under the next steps. Um, get to that that was on the last slide mm -hmm. um, and the first bullet it starts with with better data we make better decisions what we've been tracking data for quite some time so how how can we make the data better so uh, and so I think one of the best pieces that's going to help us is with our new assessment system we're not only um, the one that we're transitioning to for the next one we are going to be able to um, have it all within one platform. Right now we pull things out, send them out to campuses. Um, there's not as much information. This is gonna have everything in one place. Standards, they'll be able to look at how kids in subgroups are performing. So I'll be able to immediately filter to my EL mm -hmm. students and say, this is the standards that my EL students are struggling with. This is the standards that my um, ESS students, all of that is gonna be within this new assessment platform and is gonna be able to give teachers right in front of them without having to go to infinite campus and then go, okay, here's my ESI, you know, like, and then have to transfer it to an Excel spreadsheet. It's all going to be in one place. And so we're gonna be able to do things quicker and more efficiently and be able to then meet the needs of students faster. And perhaps a clarification would be a better understanding of data. But sometimes too, people will look at data and think that it's telling the story, but they really have to drill down deeper. And so that's what I mean by better data, is that am I really looking at it at the level that I need to? Do I have a good understanding of what it's telling me? What's the story of my data? And then how do I take that and then create action steps for that specific child using the programs that are going to meet their needs? So. 
Um, and, and I know that our title schools, I mean, one title school is going to be vastly different from another title school, whereas one you have, um, you know, maybe a majority of English language learners, mm -hmm. and you might have just a handful at another school. Okay. Um, so the culture, the needs, everything are going to be different. So do you ever receive feedback that maybe those programs, existing programs within those title schools, maybe, they, maybe there needs to be a change there? And, and how is that being looked at, addressed? That is a great question. So when we first started with Achieve 3000, so I will tell you categorically, people love Achieve 3000 literacy because it has the level set, it gets them at the level that they need. Um, and so when we have different programs and they if, if they're not meeting the needs, we definitely look at those. I talk to schools all the time in terms of, okay, this one neat program isn't meeting our needs. Okay, how are they different? What is it that you would like to look at? And so we definitely do, and we have those conversations. On the slide that talks about the school improvement process, that is a part of how we, how we collaboratively as, a, as schools and as district support, look at are the programs meeting our needs? What is it that we need? What should we do? And providing some of that more specific professional development. You know, this, this program isn't meeting the needs of my children because they're not here yet. I have to have my children here. An example, I went to, um, I had visited Kingswood. The, the interventionist had, she was getting ready for her next group. She said, I have this student in Achieve 3000. I have this student doing some 95% comprehension, and I have this student doing um, Read to Succeed. So we have different programs. She knew her children, and that's also what I mean, too, by better data. When you know your children and know what it is that they need, then she knew this child can work on this, this child, is, this program is going to meet their needs, and this is going to meet their needs. But they were all different. They were in the same intervention group. So we do provide that we want our interventionists, because they're the experts, especially, I mean, at tier three, they need to know the best what it is that their children need and what programs are going to meet those needs. And I will tell you, math um, doesn't have quite as many resources as reading. We're constantly on the lookout for reading, and we just, um, our inter math interventionist on Monday reviewed some of the existing um, programs that we have available to us to determine our, should we get some other intervention programs. So we constantly have those conversations and with our school data improvement specialists about those things, and they bring the feedback back from their school. And we have conversations with principals about what intervention programs they want. So a long answer to, yes, we look at those mm -hmm. and we always make sure that we're getting what, what's going to best meet the needs of the children. Okay. Madam President, um, I would like to thank the board for having this conversation. I think this is one of the best conversations the board has had in a long time as you are diving deep into the needs of the students, and I, I appreciate your, your very important questions. This conversation is repeating itself all over the state and all over the country, and we're not a, a bubble in Dysert. The um, network of Title I directors across Arizona are, are very engaged in these same conversations, and to your question, Ms. Ms. Densmore, um, as I look at the third bullet there, reviewing other resources, these are um, ideas that other schools might have. Hegarty, as I was visiting two schools today, are starting to use that and are seeing great results. Um, as the conversations are had at, at these, in these networks, they're shared at local, state, and national conferences where um, other directors, um, such as Mrs. Hill, get the information or are able to bring back the information. It is a continuous effort. Every year, we get a new batch of kids from all different ranks, styles, backgrounds, histories, 
and every year we we restart the clock for for the the batch of kids on it's it's not something we can just check off and say we've solved the the title one problem um, there is mountains of research about the relationship between uh, poverty and achievement um, that is again and again and again not a, an excuse it's a reality that there is direct correlation just like there's direct correlation with language ELL with special needs there's different categories of students with different needs gifted has different needs than general education so as we look at every student individually and what their needs are um, we're committed to making sure that those needs are met and that the resources are made available to them and it is an ongoing continuous uh, process to find a better way and to do it uh, for the benefit of the students so that they are on par with their peers when they cross that finish line that they have the same opportunities of success when they leave our district anybody else thank you very much for your time i appreciate it thank you Next, we move to information discussion item G2, information on the district's paper performance plan for eligible certificated staff 301 monies. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and members of cabinet. Dr. Croto will introduce this item. Thank you, Dr. Kellis. Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Kellis, cabinet, and guests, uh, I'm going to go over the agenda item tonight with uh, three separate areas. So, which employees first, how they're evaluated for 301, and then how are they qualified or how it was decided. So first, um, the eligibility piece. So all teachers, including high school lead teachers and academic intervention specialists, um, they are 301 eligible. So all teachers, high school lead teacher, academic um, intervention, or academic, sorry, intervention specialists. Um, they are paid out of 301 um, monies. Okay, that's an important piece. The following positions are also 301 eligible um, but they're paid out of 301 equivalent, which is out of our M&O money. Those positions are curriculum specialists, which includes the CTE curriculum specialist, our dean of students, uh, ESS specialists, our high school guidance counselors, our school data improvement specialists, um, any teachers on special assignment we, we may have, which we currently do not have, uh, and teaching and learning specialists, so our TLSs. The following positions are not um, eligible for 301 under our plan. Athletic trainers, audiologists, behavior coaches, family outreach specialists, uh, federal project specialists, nurses, OTs, PTs, and SLPs, behavior analysts, social workers, school counselor, mental health support, and school psychologists. Th that group is not eligible for 301, and that is governing board approved. The last time you approved that was on June uh, June 9th, 2021, um, it gets approved every year. It hasn't come to you yet in this form because if you remember last week, uh, we had to decide on which one of the three plans, so I can't put it into the writing piece until we identified the plan. So it is coming to you soon. Um, so those pieces are, also note, classified employees and administrators are not eligible for 301 monies in this district, okay? So that kind of solves which employees. So I'll, I'll stop there and ask any questions before I go too much further. Any, any questions on which employees? Can you repeat those lists? I think number one was all the first people who received 301 is all teachers, interventionists, high school, and... High school lead teacher, academic intervention specialists, and all teachers. That okay. comes out of the 301 pool. Okay. High school lead? High school, school lead teachers. Okay. Um, high school lead teachers. And then can you go over that second list, the, the 301 equivalent? Sure. Uh, curriculum specialists. Okay. Dean of students. ESS specialists. Guidance counselors for high school. Okay, hold on. Guidance counselors. High school, okay. School data improvement specialists. And teaching and learning specialists. 
We've also had listed on this list, we don't have any, but teacher on special assignment, TOSAs, that are included on that list too. Okay, thank you. Okay. Could we get this emailed to us later? Certainly, and it will be coming up to you in a board meeting too, this okay. entire written packet. I just couldn't do it before because we didn't know which one, so Got I it. could do both if you would oh, like. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, how are they evaluated? So how are they evaluated? Pay for performance. Um, all those people I mentioned that are eligible are evaluated the same way. For 21-22 school year, which is paid in 22-23, okay, so we're dealing about the one that was for under this year. They have student achievement at 30%, and you may recall this from last week. A festive is classifications at 40%. Uh, school letter grades are at 10%, and the FAC hours and attendance was 20%. All of those people are evaluated in those four areas for 301 money. Um, and it's the same. So student achievement, and you either belong to a school or you do not belong to a school. If you belong to a school as an employee, you use the school data. If you belong to a district, for instance, to the district, there's an average, a district average that's used. Okay, so I, and that's way, making that way easy. Uh, Amy runs all that information and it's much more complicated than that. Uh, effectiveness classifications are built on 65% on their evals, 20% on student achievement, and 15% on CCRI. School letter grades are pretty um, self-explanatory. So again, under the plan that the governing board approved, it's A, B, C, D, and F does not receive any money. A gets 100% or an increase from the prior year gets 100%, a B gets 90 and C gets 80%. FAC hours, if you remember from last year, is attendance, so four or less days or 15 hours that they get on the campus that they have to volunteer for FAC hours. So everybody that I mentioned that's eligible for that is evaluated on those criteria. So, um our curriculum specialists, are they evaluated? Do they yes. get an, evalu uh, an employee evaluation? Yes. Okay. And then our dean of students, ESS specialists, um, all of these people, the data improvement specialists, they each have their own individual evaluations. Correct? That is correct. Meaning a different format? Because that was one question. They I have asked. different rubrics for their positions. Yes, that is correct. Teacher evaluation is obviously a teacher evaluation on the format. So the other ones that were mentioned, they have a different format of evaluation. They don't use a teacher rubric for jobs that they do. They have a rubric that fits their position. Did that change recently? No. How many years would you say that's been the case? Since I've been here. Um, maybe somebody can help me out that's been here a little bit longer. But been I've been here three years, so that's been in place when I was here. Unless I'm, unless I'm misunderstanding the, the question or unless we're talking about two different things, I know that there were, they were relate, some, some staff in related services that were evaluated on the same rubric that teachers were evaluated on. Madam President, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I don't misunderstand the question as well. Uh, I, if we're talking about the evaluation system um, or are we talking about how 301 determinations are evaluated? Well, they're correlated, right? Or no? There are, there are components. Dr. Croto has outlined some of the components with 301. There are similar instruments that are used for evaluation with various positions. Uh, off the top of my head, I, I can't tell you exactly which ones are consistent. Um, but if, if the question is related to the evaluation of how it's determined which indicators qualify for 301 money. I, I believe that's what I'm hearing. Is that correct? Or I just want to make sure that I, I understand that the question correctly. I see, I, I see that's one piece of it, but then in general that just, when you, they were talking about evaluations, I just wanted to clarify just evaluation in general. Are there, it sounds like there's different evaluations for different positions rather than are there ever situations where non-teachers are evaluated based on a certificated teacher rubric? 
I'll, I'll defer back to Dr. Croto with the evaluation question specifically. Without going into the detail, because I don't have that, I can look specifically. <coughs> I know that each position has their own instrument. Okay. So it's outlined as their own instrument. Whether the instrument models the teacher rubric, I'd have to go back and get those. That's okay. Off I top can, of my head. We can just do a separate item for that. Okay. That would make it easier. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, thank you. That, that was kind of what I was. I was wondering too, just to make sure that everyone was evaluated based on their own rubric and for their 301 money and not somebody else's. So thank you. That was that helps that question. Okay. And then qualified the qualified portion of this, there there's some history in this document at an email you and bring to the governing board. So December eleventh, two thousand one started this journey with um, with pay for performance. Um, and that's when the governing board, the Dicer governing board, officially adopted the pay for performance. It goes all the way back to 2001. In 2007 and 8, um, that's when the uh, Dicer governing board um, talked about adding or add, did add a committee of administrators and DEA representatives to go over the plan each year and make modifications. That is still in place today. So that is from 2007, 2008. Um, that's when that took place. And, and we have met, in, in my three years here, we have met every year to discuss any changes. The changes that you saw last week, that came from the committee um, and, and brought to you for approval. So that still is in place. Uh, they are qualified to be paid under our Arizona State's, um, the statute's 15977. That's what authorizes us to pay out the 301 monies. Uh, the committee decide decided back some time, uh, probably 2007, 2008, who were they're going to use the M&O monies to pay the 301 equivalent. Um, and so that's how those pieces were decided um, and that's how they continue to be decided. It's a discussion with the committee and obviously the governing board has final approval of that, but the law clearly states who and who cannot be part of the 301 monies um, that is allocated for that. So with that, that's kind of the overview of the th three pieces. I, I will be glad to answer any questions or any clarification you need with that. And hopefully I've answered your questions. And if not, I'll be glad to research some more. Um, yes, this helps. I think what I might do is just ask for a separate agenda item just based on the evaluation just to get a better understanding. That way we have a better clear picture in our head for the evaluation piece. But 301 money is very specific to who can receive and the state funds, right? That and is correct. We are just paying the 301 equivalent out of MNO. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood those two. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Next we'll move to action discussion item H1, financial and compliance audit for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. Mr. Hicks will introduce this item. Good evening, Madam President, members of the governing board, Superintendent Dr. Kellis, colleagues and community members. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for this agenda item tonight. Um, and I will appreciate uh, Dr. Croto earlier mentioned, I, I know you guys didn't hear it, he really did think the whole crowd was here for our audit presentation, uh, so I appreciate his enthusiasm for audit and finance. Um, it was for the students. Uh, we're okay with that, we do understand that. Um, I first would like to thank our business and accounting team, um, our student information team, and everybody that does such an amazing job and all the additional people, there's um, hundreds of people that actually uh, participate in our audit. Um, and I'd especially like to thank uh, Ms. Francie wolf um, They do a great job of preparing, training, and supporting all aspects of the audit. We know that accuracy counts and so do people. Uh, we have some amazing people. And so I will hand this off to our extremely talented director of finance, Ms. Mary Dell Spidell, and the brilliant Ms. Uh, Jennifer Shields, the audit partner firm with Heinfeld Meech. I will add one uh, personal note. I know it uh, has been bantered around with uh, people that are nerds and like this stuff. I would ask that we do a voice, vo voice vote at the end um, to be covered by all statutes. So uh, the acceptance of this presentation, please do it by voice. 
There you go. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Kellis, members of cabinet, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to go over the audit results. And um, there's a, a few professional audit standards, well, more than a few, there's a lot of them. But one of them in particular requires um, two-way communication between the auditor and um, the district, or the auditee in this case. So um, that's what I've prepared for you. So just real quickly, as Mr. Hicks um, mentioned, we are your external auditors, Heinfeld Meech, and the district goes through a um, request for a proposal process. Um, and last year for fiscal, the fiscal 21 audit, that was actually the first year of a potentially five-year contract that was awarded. So that was our first year. Um, you have the timeline of the audit up there. So you can see that we start the audit usually in the spring time frame, and then we wrapped up um, with the audit report of the financial statements back in November of 2021. And although we're already in April again, you might wonder why you're um, just now hearing from us. It's because the financial statement opinion was issued back in November, but there are other related um, reports that get issued, and so bringing all of the reports to you for one roll call vote is a little more um, maybe palatable and time, time e efficient, if you will. So um, with that, these are the different audit reports that were issued. There's the communication to governance, which is what we'll cover tonight. There's the annual comprehensive financial report single audit reporting package, and then of course the Uniform System of Financial Records Compliance Questionnaire. So I'll go over the scope of the audit services quickly. Um, basically what we are contracted to do is to perform an audit in accordance with all of the auditing standards that are listed up on the screen, as well as to complete the compliance questionnaire for the Uniform System of Financial Records, which is put out by the Office of the Auditor General. So in terms of our responsibilities and the responsibilities of management, I'd just like to point out that the, um, the responsibility for fraud ultimately rests with the board and management for you know, implementing controls to deter fraud, detect fraud if it's to occur at the district. So all of that remains your responsibility. That is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to design audit procedures such that if there is a material fraud that the audit procedures would detect anomalies and you know we would do other investigation accordingly. Our um, responsibilities in particular um, is to essentially opine on the financial statements. So that's, that's ultimately what we do is design tests so that we can um, look at those, remembering that of course it is not a 100% you know, of all transactions, you know, entered into by the district, we definitely use sampling or else we would never leave because you process far more transactions than what we're able to look at in a cost-effective manner. In terms of the financial statements, you can see there's a few different estimates that are significant that affect the district. Um, the most notable ones being the usage of capital assets so things you recognize their expense over the life of the asset, like a building, um, you know, vehicles, equipment, things like that. Then the district also has the employee benefit trust, right? That um, where you cover your employees and their dependents' health insurance, and so there are claims that are associated with, you know, covering their um, their um, medical um, medical expenses, if you will. So those are. Um, there are estimates with respect to those, and then of course um, estimates with the actuarial assumptions that are related to the pension plan. So those are the most significant things where there are not um, concrete numbers and we de design additional tests and plans to deal with um, the estimates. In the actual audit itself, we are pleased to report that we did not have any audit adjustments that were required to be reported to you. We do go through a process of um, proposing conversion journal entries. That's part of the non-audit services that we provide, which is the actual compilation of the financial statements itself from underlying accounting data here at the district. Um, so those conversion entries are reviewed and approved by management prior to the issuance of the financial statements. We also assist with the preparation of the what's called the CIFA, or the Schedule of Expenditures of Federal Awards, and the related data collection form, which those are what's required um, related to your federal audit. 
Um, other communications that are required um, include whether or not there were any disagreements between us as auditors and management of the district related to financial reporting or other um, you know, uh, implementation of audit st um, accounting standards rather. There were none of those to report. Uh, management did provide the required representations at the end of the audit. And just as a note, um, as your external independent auditors, we are required to be independent of management. And we go through um, a series of processes every year to ensure that not only myself, but all of our team members that work on the audit are in fact independent and meet all of our re relevant ethical requirements. So in terms of the um, financial statements, there's a few page numbers if you wanted. To, it's um, very big, it's you know over like 150 pages, so I, I put some highlighted page up there. The only thing I'll point out is page 22, which is the independent auditor's report. That's what I'm responsible for. Um, the district received what we call an unmodified opinion, also known as a clean opinion, which means that we did not have any material misstatements or anything that we noted through the audit, so essentially the best that you can do. Um, with respect to the single audit reporting package, page 10 includes what's the schedule of findings and question costs. So as you know, um, the district is the recipient of a lot of federal money. In the fiscal 21 audit, there was over $38 million of federal dollars expended. So the programs that we tested that were related to that $38 million are those um, four programs that are listed up on the screen. I feel like one of those is in error. I don't think we looked at the child and adult food care program. I apologize. <laughs> we looked at your coronavirus um, relief fund, the education stabilization funds, and special education. There were no deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal controls that were required to be reported. However, there was one deficiency related to one of the uh, federal programs that we um, tested, and that was related to the special education program, and it was a, a payroll item. And then lastly, the uniform system of financial records, the compliance questionnaire. So as I mentioned, that's the compliance questionnaire that the Auditor General's Office puts out. And it includes a lot of different areas. And so as Mr. Hicks mentions, you know, thank you to everybody involved in the audit. This includes um, people that are out, out at your school sites as well, um, not just the finance office. But you can see um, that there's a few of the, I think there's like 25 different areas that we look at. Um, but um, we did have a few minor instances of noncompliance, but nothing that rose to any significance. And then just lastly, um, want to thank also from me, management, and staff for being incredibly helpful um, during the audit. It's no easy feat. They have to take time out of their daily, like their daily duties in order to um, gather a lot of information and answer a lot of questions from my team, so thank you to them. And then also, just as a heads up, there's a, a very big accounting standard that's coming down for next fiscal year, well, the fiscal year that you're currently in, but the next audit, which um, will significantly change um, lease reporting. So, um, you know, Ms. Spidell and <laughs> uh, Mr. Hicks are probably very aware of what's coming, but um, there will be some differences in um, in just accounting standards that we apply. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Fidel. Thank you, Ms. Shields. So as Ms. Shields mentioned, um, we'll review now the sections here with our instances of noncompliance. <clears throat> so we have the Uniform System of Financial Records. And so um, if you're familiar with that, it's about a 400-page manual that we are uh, required to follow. It outlines just the minimum internal controls that as a district we are required to have in place. Um, any policies, procedures as well that we need to have, have in place as a school district. Um, in the areas of accounting, here's just a few areas noted, accounting, financial reporting, student attendance reporting, et cetera. So there's about 20 different compliance areas in that overall manual. And so what the Arizona Auditor General then does is, while we're required to follow all of those, they extract certain requirements from that manual itself and they have then designed the USFR compliance questionnaire, which is the document that the auditors then come in and review to what level and what degree of compliance we follow as a district. And so the process over that test work is the auditors make selections in that USFR questionnaire document that you've been provided. There's a sample size of how many transactions they reviewed, um, any areas of noncompliance they may have noted. And so um, overall, they then rotate to different school sites on a different, um, different years and or review departments, uh, transactions. And so they use that data to determine our level of compliance. 
So just a reminder, materiality is not a consideration with this, and so really ultimately they determine whether it's a yes or a no answer based on their audited selections and they review upon our processes and our compliance. So on this slide, you'll see the different questions. There is a total of 175 questions on that USFR questionnaire. And out of those 175, we had five instances where it was a no answer. Um, but ultimately, we had a 97.14% compliance rating as a school district. And so um, those areas we can review on the next few slides. So this particular one was in the area of expenditures. And one of the requirements in the USFR is to ensure that goods and services are received prior to making payment on those. Unfortunately, when, um, when we did review this, we noted that there had been a, um, a service that had been provided. And so upon receive a, a service that had not been provided prior to paying for those services. And so it was of concern when we learned of it. And so we wanted to be sure we addressed it quickly. And so we worked with that department. We ensured we received that refund from the vendor. Um, we worked with the Arizona Department of Education to be sure we appropriately accounted for those records and that everything was in line with, with them on their end. And so ultimately, as a district, we did not end up overpaying for these services. Everything had been corrected. And so we've again reviewed that, doc that process. As you see in this section here, it, we, um, we note the corrective action that's been taken. And then also we look to those previous five years just as a comparison to see is it a pervasive issue? Is it something that we have to address as a training issue? Was it a clerical issue? It just generally helps us to identify what's the root cause of that and then really work with the various departments to identify how can we correct it moving forward. So that's as it related to expenditures. These next areas um, or items are related to student attendance reporting. Um, and so as you know, especially in student attendance reporting, there's many transactions that touch many different um, hands out at our school sites. And so this is truly one of the most decentralized processes that we have where we have various registrars and attendance clerks and everyone who is ultimately handling these complex transactions. And so while we do have a great um, student information system team that does do monthly um, trainings and reviews with their school sites, do internal audits, there are going to be potentially instances of non-compliance, and that's what we noted on here. And so um, we did note that there were four different areas. Some of those you'll see have been um, repeat areas, and so it, it's something we want to continue to focus on. But we did um, note that it was a complex year. Um, we kind of look back at this being fiscal year 2021, and we think back to where were we? July 1st of 2020, which is when a lot of these items were gathered from that school year. And truly that school year, we started off with students doing remote learning and then they came back in person. And then some may have continued to stay on an online learning platform. We had staff that would have typically been performing these duties may have been out. And so it was definitely a far more challenging year in an already complex environment. Um, but regardless, we do still want to continue to focus on this. We want to take a look at what these results are and then really hone in on those opportunities to continue training our staff. And so I know our student information systems team has been working diligently on identifying what are these areas that we can continue to focus on. And the final item was related to um, the special education cluster program. It was a time and effort documentation that is a requirement for federal programs that you maintain time and effort. If a person spends 100% of their time on a program, you complete a semi-annual report. Unfortunately, in this particular instance, this employee had ultimately ended up being 60% of their time. So rather than a semi-annual, it should have been a monthly, pro, um, a monthly time and effort log. And so we've addressed that and are working with our HR department to make sure anytime there's a change in that cost objective, we're apprised of that to make sure we complete the appropriate uh, time and effort documentation. So those are the items. Oh, I sure shut that off. Um, so we'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Anyone have any questions? I just want to say, um, great to see you again, Ms. Shields. Um, uh, and I know Heinfield and Mish does a, an awesome job. And we're not the only district that has issues with attendance or as far as uh, to find a district that has 100% on attendance, you're not gonna find it. You're just not going to. But yes, we continue with training each year uh, just to make sure that things uh, run smoothly. Um, and quite honestly, Miss uh, Spidel, uh, you're right. It was a, a very wonky year. And to actually try to get something 
um, with the attendance to even get close was going to be an interesting thing, especially for students that they withdrew or they did not withdraw and they were still on the rolls. And so, yes, I, I appreciate all the work that both of you have been doing. Thank you. Any other questions? Now, overall, a great job. I mean, to be mm -hmm. 97 point something percent um, is amazing. Um, and I, I wish the attendance wouldn't pop up all the time. I know we always talk about that, the attendance piece of it. It seems as we're pretty true. consistent of having um, dings in our attendance area. But, um, you know, I know we're going to keep working on it. So. Yes, definitely. It is, and it is effort. I know uh, Mr. Hicks may alluded to that um, as far as just it, it's, it's a lot that's out there at every school site. And so really to be a 97%, it really speaks volumes to the work that really our school staff, our department staff, yes. everyone that's out there touching all of these transactions ensures that things are appropriately recorded. And so it is, I think, a testament. I just kind of want to give the kudos to everyone that's out there working mm -hmm. daily to make sure these are accurate. And so we get to present the information to you, but really they're doing so much of this, the volume of this work. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you. Okay, um, so per Mr. Hicks' request, oh. um, we'll go ahead and do a voice vote. Um, I move that the governing board accept the financial audit and compliance questionnaire from Hindfield Meach and Company, uh, certified public accounts for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021. Second. Motion made by Tracy Sarah Singfeld, seconded by Don Densmore. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we move to action discussion item two, recommendation to approve notice of reasonable assurance to substitute employees language for the 2022-2023 school year. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. Dr. Crudo will introduce this item. Thank you, Dr. Kellis. Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Kellis, cabinet guests, uh, tonight I bring to you language for uh, the, the letters of reasonable assurance that we issue to substitute employees um, and would like you to approve that language so we can issue them. The substitute, it's important to know the groups of uh, substitute employees are hourly classified substitutes, exempt classified substitutes, and exempt administrative substitutes. These are not substitute teachers. They work for ESI. These are classified or administrative substitutes that come in and fill in for our schools. So maybe a secretary is out and we need a secretary to cover, or administrators out and we have an administrator come in and cover. So this language we issue to them, it's not a contract binding, um, but it's language to tell them we would like them back. We would like all the substitutes we can back, um, and, and we need them back, so we issue them this letter of insurance. It's also been approved um, by our attorney, um, and present that to you, and I'll take any questions. Any questions from the board? No? I move the board approve the notice of reasonable assurance to substitute language for eligible substitute employees for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. Second. Motion made by Christine Pritchard, seconded by Don Densmore. Motion carries. Next we action discussion three, a recommendation for authorization to issue notification of reasonable assurance to substitute employees for the 2022-2023 school year, Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. Having just approved the language of um, the assurance, reasonable assurance, administration now requests permission to issue these issuances of, um, of notification. Any questions? I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve the issuance of notification of reasonable assurance to eligible substitute employees for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. Motion made by Joe Grant, seconded by Tracy Sawyer Singfeld. Motion carries. Next we move to action discussion H4. 
Recommendation to approve revisions to the 2021-2022 and 2022-2023 governing board meeting schedules and the 2022-2023 policy monitoring cycle. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. At the last regular governing board meeting, the board voted to approve revisions to the uh, board meeting date to Thursdays starting June 1st. And as such, um, the calendars that are presented to you for approval include starting this June with the board meeting occurring on June 9th, Thursday instead of June 8th. There's also that completes this academic year. And then the board is presented with an additional calendar for the next academic year, 2022 to 2023, which moves all of the regularly scheduled board meetings to Thursday. There's also the request of the board that additional board meetings be added when possible. And you can see that four additional board meetings have been added throughout the year um, when possible. Uh, you can see the, the dates typically that are added coincide with um, fall break, spring break, or months that have five weeks. And then on the last um, calendar that needed to be approved, the board has previously approved the policy monitoring um, document, which is a schedule of each board meeting when policies will be brought forward for monitoring. Those were previously scheduled for Wednesdays and the dates have been changed to coincide with the recommended calendars that are presented for your approval. Thank you. Starting with the 2021-2022 um, calendar, do we feel like uh, there's still one meeting in June? I, uh, I actually don't have a preference either way as far as if we add a second meeting in June, other than the fact we do have five Thursdays in June. Um, I know, like I said, when we get to the second calendar, I I've said before, I think a district this large, we should not have just one meeting a month during the regular school year, where obviously there's not as much going on in the summer. I think that's an opportunity for the board to, board and administration to um, do some work. Um, but that's just me. I'm only one of five. So I don't, I don't, I just want to throw that out there as far as if we want to use the summer months to add a second meeting date, um, which would then have pertain to the 2021-2022 calendar with June 2022. Does anybody have a preference either way? I don't mind, I'm sorry. I don't mind having a second meeting in June of this year. Um, just depends on how everyone else feels about it. Well, I guess in, in years past when we've had June meetings, um, and sometimes we've had a second June meeting, uh, that's because we've possibly have needed something with the finance department as far as getting something approved. Um, do we have business that we need to work on for a second meeting in June? In well, years past, we haven't. Didn't we have to call a special meeting last year? That was in, in July. June? Oh, that was July. And that's usually a, like a five minute meeting. Well, or it's just, again, in regard to board development or study sessions or district planning, things like that, um, there may not be things to approve, but just things to process, and that's what I was thinking. But like I said, uh, I'm fine either way, whatever the majority of the board wants to do with that. I, we can always do what we've done in, in other situations where if something's coming up or we find that there's a lot of requests for specific topics. We can just schedule it as needed during the summer, like whatever the board wants to do. So. I'm okay with one meeting in June. Because <laughs> <laughs> then you have to revise the 23 calendar because there's only one meeting in June for that one as well. Well, yeah, we're gonna, we have to look at that. I'm just look, starting with the 2021, 2022 right now. So, okay. I'm fine with either way. I'm, I'm also fine with just having one meeting in June and then if we need to, we can always schedule another meeting. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, and then the 2022-2023, um, when I look at months like November, oh, that's June again, so I guess it's really, well, November and December, I mean, there would be room to move to like November, of course, I guess that would be back-to-back -back meetings. 
maybe December 1st and 15th, rather than just having one in December would be an option. Madam President. Yes, I didn't, I didn't know if Louise was saying something. So I didn't uh, a little bird was whispering in my ear. <laughs> um, we have been advised previously by um, legal counsel that in order to be most transparent with our community that we be consistent with our meeting dates and when you switch them around, sometimes the community gets confused on if there's a board meeting or not. So by sticking with either the first and third or the second and fourth, it's very consistent. Um, if the board wishes to switch a month from the second and fourth to the first and third, obviously that can be done, but just a little extra information for your consideration. And to clarify, I wouldn't, I, there was no agenda involved in trying to be misleading or anything with the community. I, I know like for myself, I always check the calendar if there's a meeting I wanna go to. Um, and it would just be, you know, certainly, I could understand the point if it were a boundary change meeting and then people count on it on a certain day and then we decide to do a boundary change meeting on an off day. But if it's just to accommodate the business of the district during a month that is a holiday, um, that's the only thing I was thinking, was just to make sure we have plenty of time to get the board's business done and the district's business done, but certainly, just as we do, we can always add meetings, which we've done in the past, so. It was just for the, discussion. The only one I had um, concerns with for the 2022-2023 school year is November 9th being switched to November 10th with Veterans Day being the following Friday. That might be cumbersome to, to some people because that's a three-day weekend. Well, I guess that should have been thought of last week before, not last week, last meeting before we actually voted to change from Wednesdays to Thursdays. Uh, that's a perfect example of conflict in the November meeting. In case people want to go out of town? Oh, well, it's, it's a national holiday and um, we're not, well, we are open, but... Um, but it's always uh, on the 11th, but it's, it's not always, always on a Thursday. Right, but we've had other things before, so. I just know that we've changed calendars, you know, mid-year many times, including for Columbus Day. Um, which was completely eliminated. That's gone. Madam President, I would add as well, just on that specific day that Ms. Densmore referenced, varsity football games will be played on that Thursday night and not Friday. Hey guys. <laughs> not that that matters, but just so that We're you're aware that important stuff now. The, that, that involves um, a lot of people with band, athletes, cheerleaders, pommies, et cetera. Just for that one date, right? I think we can't have Madam it President, both ways, Moore, unfortunately. Yes. If, if Dr. Yes. Scullis is saying we need to keep it consistent and mm -hmm. if we change it off of a Thursday, then it's gonna cause a problem in the community, then we either mean it 100% or we don't mean it 100% and we switch it up. But if we're gonna switch up November, then there's no harm in switching up other dates. So I don't, I don't care, because I feel like if people wanna, you know, if they're, if they know that they're gonna come to a board meeting, they're gonna check to make sure, okay, it's on the 10th, or they're gonna check the calendar and see when it is, but. I think that's kind of an unfair thing because when you look at October, um, we're doing the first Thursday in October, which is inconsistent with every other month. Right, well, we could say the same thing for November because of Veterans Day and Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We could switch that week and be inconsistent with what's expected of the community and make a notice. So I, I don't see an issue with the Thursday, just maybe moving the one date in November. Just my opinion. Which date are you recommending moving it to? Either so the third or 17th. Are you talking about moving the date or adding a date? moving that's a heavy holiday month for people okay so I, I'm just uh, clarifying for myself because I, I feel like we threw out a couple of different ideas 
we threw out the idea of maybe having a second meeting, having a meeting on the 3rd and the 17th possibly, or are, are you, you just, are we just talking about moving the meeting up on the 10th to a different week? When I mentioned move, adding, having a second meeting, like when I was looking at November and December, I caught myself, uh, November, if we move it, uh, if we add two, like we move it to the 3rd and the 17th, the 3rd is basically the very next week after the previous meeting. So, yeah. so I think if anything, if there was going to be any movement for November, it would make more sense to move it to the 17th. Agreed. Okay, so we're just talking about moving, pushing it back a week and not adding a second meeting. Mm -hmm. Is for that no, right? For okay. November, yeah. Just to clarify. Is, is if, if there was going to be a switch in that, in that month, that's what I would think would make the most sense, but mm -hmm. yeah. does anybody have any other, um, I'm assuming nobody wants two meetings in December, so I'm not even going to say <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else have any? questions or comments about either the calendar or the policy monitoring cycle? I just have a question for um, our wonderful and amazing administrative assistant to the governing board. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to clarify, when we did this back in February, you secured the boardroom, correct, for all of our board meetings. So now with changing the calendar, we you have now had to move that reservation to the new Thursdays. So were groups, because um, anybody can reserve the boardroom, okay? So were groups, um, did they reserve the boardroom on Thursdays? That is correct. And there were several meetings that had to be moved. Okay. So I, but I swip, swapped them out and said, here's your options. So I gave them options. Because even, even though we have now moved it to Thursdays, um, the board meetings take precedence in this room. And so I just don't want anybody to look at the board um, saying that they keep changing their minds on where to move stuff. I mean, we have other groups here and here that use this room, not just us, but board meetings, yes, they do take precedence. I just don't want to be looked unfavorably in other departments eyes that's the one thing I just want is there ever a time when dr. Callis or any or other administrators have asked to move meeting dates or add to calendars and it's caused a problem okay mm -hmm. I'll entertain the motion I move to approve the revisions to the 2021, 2020, 2022, and 2022, 2023 governing board meeting schedules and the 2022, 2023 policy monitoring cycle as presented with the exception of November of 2023 to being moved to November 17th. Second. Motion made by Don Densmore, seconded by Christine Pritchard. Motion carries. Next, we move to action discussion five, discussion and action to set a date for an executive session for the superintendent's year-end evaluation. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. Each year, the board has the opportunity to provide an end-of-year evaluation for the superintendent. It is proposed that this be achieved on the regularly scheduled board meeting on May 25th. will be all done with graduation and the end of the year stuff, <laughs> hopefully. And you won't be 
in town on the 9th. Is that right, Dr. Kellis? Uh, Madam President, that is correct. Does anyone um, have any concern with the 25th? I move the governing board um, set an executive session for the superintendent's year-end evaluation on May 25th, 2022. Second. Motion made by Christine Pritchard, seconded by Joe Grant. Motion carries. Next, we move for requests for future agenda items. How many items to request? I do. Um, I would like a, an information item regarding K through four schools um, for their fourth grade promotions. Anyone else? I would like to request an item on employee evaluations information. And just to be clear, because if mine matches what you're asking, then I won't ask for a second one. Okay. All right. um, I, my question is, is I, I would just like information on how each classification um, is evaluated with their rubrics. Each like uh, employee group? Yes, each employee group. So like um, an ESS specialist, what their evaluation looks like as opposed to a TLS or a curriculum specialist. So the differentiation of each evaluation. And this might fit into it too, but I know for me, I was also thinking, we know we have the teacher evaluation rubric, but so instructional versus non-instructional, that would be easier to yes anybody else all right next uh, we have an executive session um, call for an executive session pursuant to ARS section 38-431.03 a3 and a4 for the purpose of receiving legal advice from and providing direction to the attorney for the public body regarding resolution of special education due process complaint captioned as 22C-DP-026-ADE pursuant to ARS 38-431.03A3 and A4. Um, is there anyone else that would like to receive legal advice from and provide direction to the attorney for the public body regarding the superintendent's contract of employment and pursuant to ARS 38-431.03A3 to get legal advice from the attorney for the public body regarding governing board policy 2.12 and contracting slash use of private counsel. So I move that we adjourn for executive session. Do I have a second? Second. Is that Joe Grant? Uh, made by Christine Pritchard, seconded by Joe Grant. Motion carries our joint for executive session.
meeting. Moving to action discussion items continued. Uh, K1, possible action to provide direction to the attorney for the public body as discussed in executive session. I will move that the attorney act as directed in executive session. Second. Motion made by Crystal Schaffen, seconded by Christine Pritchard. Motion carries. Next, we move to K2, approval of settlement agreement to resolve special education due process complaint filed as 22C-DP-026-ADE. Dr. Callis. Madam President, this was discussed in executive session and is available for the board to vote on. I move to the board approve the settlement agreement to resolve a special education due process complaint filed as 22C-DP-026-ADE and authorize the district's director of exceptional student services to execute any further documentation as necessary. Second. Motion made by Christine Pritchard, seconded by Don Dunsmore. Motion carries. Can I change my vote on the first one? Am I allowed to do that? No. No? I thought we were going in order, so. Oh, well. yeah. We're going on the order of the agenda. We're moving to adjournment now. I move the board adjourn the meeting. Second. Motion made by Christine Pritchard, second by Crystal Schaffen. So you're going to vote no on the other thing? Mm -hmm. Motion carries.